Welcome to Hot Chips 18. Session 3 Memory and Storage. So the session is for memory and storage. I'll introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. David Fish. He has graduated from a uh, Case Western Reserve University and has got a master's degree from Southern Method Methodist University. His semiconductor career began with uh, DLAMs at Mostec in 1980 and went on to the uh, include FRAM and the DRAM products engineering and design at Chris Saris National and the Uni United Memories. In 1998, uh, he joined the Enhanced Memory Systems and served as uh, the VP of Engineering. He joined Tarvis in uh, 2003, working in the intellectual property uh, domain. Finally, uh, David joined the uh, Innovative Silicon Inc. in this year as a uh, director of architecture. Please. Hello. Uh, I've been told I've got about 20 minutes, and I was going through the proceedings and recognized that I've set the the conference record for the largest number of slides. So uh, I think to get through all of this, we're going to have to do some uh, branch prediction and some out of order execution. So, you know, my, my talk is uh, focused on the ZRAM, it's a floating body memory. And to kind of understand what I need to fly through, uh, can I get a show of hands on how many of you are familiar with uh, this type of memory? Okay, so a bit. Uh, how many of you are interested in learning about how the memory works? Uh, okay, first, well, that's good. <laughs> Versus uh, how, uh, you know, the application side of the memory. Okay, the, the physicists win. <laughs> so we'll go through the, we'll spend a little more time going through the first section. Uh, and then we can fly through uh, the application areas, which you probably know more about than, than I do. Uh, okay, first I'd like to recognize uh, co-authors uh, Anand Singh and Greg Popov. Okay, so we've kind of talked uh, the, the first half of this. Let's see. Okay, the first half of the presentation is uh, kind of how it works. And it looks like I've advanced my slides, which is fine. Uh, the ZRAM is a floating body memory. It's compatible with uh, standard SOI logic, uh, works with NMOS, PMOS devices, uh, gives you good SCR performance. It's a very small cell. Uh, and you know, one key difference, uh, if we look at soft error rates, uh, that, that performance actually improves uh, with operational frequency. And we'll, we, we can understand that a bit, I think, as we go through how the memory uh, works. I, a key point to make is there's, there's no new uh, laws of physics that <laughs> we're inventing here. It's, it's actually a pretty simple concept. Okay. Uh, floating body memory uh, exploits the floating body effect. Uh, the basic cell is a single transistor with a connection to the drain, the source, and the gate. And that forms your word line, a bit line, and a source line. So very similar to a DRAM, except the DRAM is sort of a one-way street. You, you have a, a transistor and then a large capacitor to store charge. Uh, with the ZRAM, you're storing charge in the floating body. Uh, when you build a transistor on an SOI process, you automatically get every transistor has its own substrate, his own body. And charge that can be stored in that body will affect the current through your transistor, the on current through your transistor. Uh, if you do absolutely nothing, 
and run, do an IV trace uh, on a transistor on SOI, you'll, you'll, exhibit, you'll see this kink effect, which is increased drive current, which is just the byproduct of having stored positive charge or generated positive charge in your substrate. So this uh, illustrates the effect of uh, writing a one, is the uh, current under operation of your transistor generates impact ionization, which ends up with uh, charge trapped in the uh, floating body. Now, in the real world, it goes much faster than this, okay? <laughs> Okay, let's look at uh, zeros is kind of the opposite, is biasing the transistor, basically bringing up your drain and gate voltages to basically push the holes out of the floating body. And uh, that operation <laughs> is also quite a bit faster than what's being illustrated here. Okay, uh, this is what your current through your cell looks like, uh, depending on whether you've stored a one or a zero in your cell. Uh, this is showing a logic zero and a logic one. And the key thing is, is that the current through your transistor is different based on whether you've trapped holes in the, in the body or uh, stored electrons in the, in the body. Uh, very similar in a way to flash memory storage, except instead of using extra energy to store the charge in, in the oxide, you're just storing it in, in the floating body. The difference is that flash is non-volatile. This is volatile and has to be refreshed. Okay. I, I thought it might be instructive to just compare the ZRAM to a conven conventional embedded DRAM and just highlight uh, some of the differences. Uh, the ZRAM works by storing charge in its floating body. Uh, we don't try to sense that charge. I think that's one of the first questions that we'll, we, we are faced with is, that's not a lot of charge. How can you uh, sense this? Uh, you're getting the amplification right out of your cell. You're looking at the current through the cell, which is affected by that charge. With a DRAM, you're storing the charge in a capacitor, and then you're taking that charge and dumping it onto a large uh, bit line and then re-amplifying the data. So one of the key observations is because of that fundamental difference, your initial latency can be very quick with this technology. Now, we'll go in a little bit later as to why it's not as fast as uh, SRAM, but in terms of that initial access time, you get a, a good advantage by having that initial gain in your, in your actual memory cell. Okay, process uh, simplicity. Let's look at uh, conventional uh, DRAM uh, versus uh, the floating body memory. Uh, I'd say we're a little bit weak on the wow factor. <laughs> you know, the, the first time I looked at a uh, stacked cross-section in embedded memory or trench cells, it's, it's really uh, astounding to see that. Uh, and this just is uh, a little too simple. But, you know, the advantage is, is it's simpler, it's uh, no new materials, it's lithography friendly. So you give up a little bit on the, uh, wow, isn't this thing look great? And what you gain is on yield and, and lower cost. Okay. So if we summarize some of these features, uh, the fact that you have a small cell size lets you have very dense arrays. Uh, because you have current sensing, uh, we're not limited really in terms of how big our bit lines can be. So if you look at a typical macro where each of these arrays is can basically run independently. Uh, in this case, I've got my bit lines running vertically and my word lines running horizontally. Uh, this length is typically limited in a DRAM by, you know, how big is your, your capacitor relative to your bit line? You know, it's like taking a, a pail of sand and pouring it into a sandbox and then trying to decide did I either add sand or take it away. That's the DRAM world. In our world, we're measuring a difference in current. And so with current sensing, we can run these bit lines very long and get more efficiency out of the sense amp. Uh, the other difference is because during a read, all we have to do is run current through the transistor to see is it a one or a zero. We don't have large bit line swings during the read, so this can give you some, some good power, power savings. Uh, this is kind of good news and bad news. The uh, bit line pitch is limited by your metal spacing. So 
you can really stack a lot of uh, cells very efficiently in one row. Uh, the problem becomes later on is uh, how do I tie sense circuitry on such a tight pitch? And so those are some of the challenges that you face uh, in the architecture and, and design world. Uh, and that tends to drive also uh, a global I.O. line being drawn at uh, a greater pitch than the uh, SENSAM pitch. And it also is why uh, running the, this product in a burst mode uh, really gives you the optimal power performance uh, trade-off. Okay. Uh, it can certainly work in a single mode where you just burst out one bit of data, but if you can burst it out in a burst to four, you can save a considerable amount of power. Okay, uh, this is comparing uh, just the lithography of an SRAM cell. SRAM cell, you have uh, typically six transistors. I think some future generations may be going up to eight transistors. Uh, and this is looking at the lithography of a uh, DRAM cell. If we compare that to the ZRAM cell, you can see that, well, one, the lines are all straight and your cell is fairly small and simple. So that's where the comment of uh, a lithography-friendly uh, layout comes to play. So the challenges uh, faced with this technology is, well, the, the, you know, every, there's two sides to every coin. The advantage of having a small cell size makes it difficult to maintain array efficiency. So you know, we often say, hey, we can make the cell bigger and then our array efficiency looks better. But the bottom line is, is how many bits of data can you fit in every millimeter squared of silicon, and that's what's gonna drive the uh, performance and cost advantage. Uh, because of the pitch constraints, it's difficult to make sense amps as fast as the sense amps you might see with embedded SRAM. Uh, so your random access times will be slower than embedded SRAM. But compensating for that could be you have more density. So if you have more cash, if you have a higher hit rate, maybe you actually come out ahead. And, or if you keep the same amount of memory, your routing distances can be shorter. And that has some power and access time advantages. Other factors is there's more overhead. Uh, the reads with the floating body memory are not fully destructive, but they are partially destructive. So you do have to, at some point, restore the data. Uh, in addition, you have to run refresh operations, which is very much like uh, what you would see with embedded DRAM. Uh, there are ways to mitigate this. Uh, pipeline operation and architecture changes can be used to hide the refresh behind a burst, for example, or to access banks independently within a, a given macro. Okay, we're slide 14, and uh, I've got f 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, let's, let's analyze. This is more of the application side, so I think uh, if I can go through this pretty quickly, we can have some time also for, for questions. Uh, memory density versus speed, that's just a classic trade-off. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, other factors. Okay. Uh, this is just comparing, I think, one of the compelling arguments for this technology uh, is uh, with ZRAM, uh, you can increase the number of memory bits you have in a given amount of silicon space. And this is just a comparison of uh, ZRAM at different technology nodes to embedded DRAM and to embedded SRAM. And then the height of these bars is just reflecting trade-offs within the macro where, uh, you know, I want to reduce the cost, or here I want to improve the performance. And, you know, we equate this to like a balloon. Uh, you, you know, it's got three legs. It's got the uh, power, it has cost, and it has performance. And if you squeeze one leg, the other legs kind of get bigger. And if you squeeze all three legs, it pops. <laughs> This is sort of illustrating that here is, I'm just looking at, and this is on a bit by bit basis, not, uh, not factoring in that you could have a 128 bit wide uh, IO stream, is just looking at a maximum sustained frequency with a burst of four and two pipeline stages, and just showing some of the trade-offs you can make at different technology nodes. And I think the main thing to take out of this graph is that as you increase the density, typically you give up on your maximum sustained frequency. So that's just a, you know, one leg of the balloon versus the other. 
so access time is better than embedded DRAM, but uh, an approach is that of SRAM. You get the benefits of the underlying SOI technology. Uh, forever, you know, one of the concerns with SOI transistors is uh, the amount of current you get through is, it depends on what, how the transistor was last used. Uh, but the other side of that is you get more gain out of your transistors. So for the same size silicon, or you get more power or more drive capability from your circuits. Uh, we're also benefiting by low voltage swings and short interconnects. Now there's a couple things that we can do to really improve on the access time, and this could play into your architectures depending on how things are put together. Uh, if we know what subarray is being addressed and if we can get that information sooner, we can take that array and pre-charge the bit lines to a voltage to where as soon as we turn on the word line, single line, uh, current starts to flow. So that can give you a 50% improvement in your access time. Uh, other things we can do are just build smaller arrays. The smaller the array, typically, the, f the faster it can be. Uh, this is an illustration of a high-speed macro where we have shortened the bit lines and word lines. We've increased the size of the sense amps, and this will allow us to run at a much higher uh, frequency with much lower latency, but you pay the price in terms of having a, a larger macro. Okay. This is, these are a set of slides I'm going to really fly through. Uh, these are just really made up examples just to illustrate the point that if you increase your cache size, then, and you get a performance or improved hit rate, overall memory performance can get better. And uh, I'm gonna fly through these a bit to save some time for questions. Uh, you know, basically just looking at the penalty of a miss, and when you factor that in, if you get a better hit rate with more memory, then your overall average access time can improve. So we'll do some jumping here to the conclusion of this, that if your hit rate starts off fairly low, you can find that by just increasing your memory density by a small amount, you can improve your performance, reduce your latency, and reduce your cost. So everything is normalized to a cost and latency of one. On the other hand, if your curve is not as steep, where the hit rate is not varying as much with density, then it'll take more ZRAM density to get into this win-win uh, situation where you have improved uh, performance and lower cost. Okay, this is just illustrating uh, the memory can be pipelined and uh, no red flag yet, so we're doing good. Uh, other options is multi-banking and, multi and burst reads, refreshes during bursts, write-backs during burst. Uh, another key question, uh, controller-level uh, logic, is the write-back required? Once you read the data, is it needed again? If it's not, uh, life gets to be pretty simple. Uh, okay, routing impact. Uh, basically, if your chip is smaller, you can run it faster with low power, lower power. <laughs> okay, and if we talk about active power, uh, you know, basically here you're just seeing the benefit of an SOI process. Your junctions don't go all the way down, they're, they're shallower junctions. So you have less parasitic source drain capacitance, your VT slopes are better, and this is debatable, but depending on the application, operating power can be three times lower than a bulk solution. Power can also be modulated with architecture. Uh, large line sizes help, longer bursts help, and uh, a big factor for us also is a shorter bit line, just reduces the amount of capacitance we have to move on every access. Um, and a standby power. Standby current is composed of both refresh current and peripheral leakage current. Uh, on the peripheral side, we can, uh, we can really win uh, with an SOI process. Also, uh, when we're in standby, the array leakage is minimal because the standby conditions can have the source, strain, and gate of your array, everything held at zero volts. And that's pretty, pretty nice for uh, low power. Okay. So in summary, 
you know, I, I think the uh, ZRAM embedded memory is an exciting technology. It's compatible with standard logic. No new materials, uh, simple process, uh, no new laws of physics. Uh, small cells, low cost, very scalable. I mean, we really see, uh, don't see these, these roadblocks ahead in terms of scalability. Works with N and PMOS transistors, good SCR performance, and I think uh, we've went over some of the low power advantages. And very much appli application configurable. Thank you. Uh, Dave Patterson from UC Berkeley. Uh, uh, can I ask a couple of short questions to kind of put this in perspective? Yes. Uh, in, in a standard TSMC process, is there any extra processing steps for ZRAM? Uh, you know, I'm, I won't focus on uh, TSMC, but I can just say in general, it's a different starting material. And uh, one of the, uh, the differences you mean, are the very SOI or? You know, you're starting with an SOI wafer. Okay, so if it was an SOI process, is it a different, are there extra uh, mass steps? There's fewer mass steps uh, because one, you're not processing, if, well, it depends, okay. If, if you're making uh, stack capacitors or trench capacitors, it's definitely fewer steps. Okay. Uh, the other thing is there's no need for well implants. So uh, there's some, you know, that would probably be the only real process difference is uh, the overhead and, and having a P-channel device is a little bit lower with SOI. Uh, I'm not a, a total expert on this, but to, to first order, I would say uh, it's, it's going to be fewer masking and, steps. And then the constants versus embedded DRAM or, or SRAM are factor of four over SRAM about uh, the same size or factor of two over embedded DRAM? Uh, that's approximate in terms of and, the and then it's memory about density. 20 or 30 percent slower than SRAM? Yeah, and that's, that's also configurable depending on how aggressive right. do we want to be. You know, I actually went through the numbers, and we can be as fast as an SRAM, <laughs> but then we were as big as an SRAM. So, you know, <laughs> so, uh, so it's the trade-off. But I think there's a nice sweet spot there where you can give up a little bit of performance and gain it back two, threefold uh, by taking advantages of more density or lower power. Right. I would say, given the prior presentation with L, now that L3 caches are coming. There seems to be, if this works, there's plenty of applications that would like factors of four. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. Thank you. Hi. Um, so you made the claim that uh, you've got a 10x better uh, soft error rate than SRAM? Yes. I'm not a physicist, but can you go into more detail on how with yeah, a smaller I'd device be you're getting that? I'd be happy to. You know, the. Uh, um, the biggest factor there is that the, and this is based on data that we've taken, and uh, there may be SRAMs out there that might have lower soft error rates, but the driving factor there is that the cell size is smaller than the SRAM cell size. So the, the probability of getting a hit is down. Uh, being built on SOI also helps reduce the, uh, we have never seen twin bits, so the, you, you don't have these funneling effects. If we do apple-to-apple -apple comparison though to SRAM on SOI, the biggest difference is we have much less junction exposed and a, a much uh, poorer uh, collection efficiency. And this is a case where you don't want to be collecting uh, charge from a, like an alpha particle strike. I don't know if that... Uh, it's good enough for me. Thank okay. you. Now, is it SOI only or does it also, the ZRAM can work on a bulk process? So work better with SOI or just can't work without SOI? Uh, there's creative ways, I think, to, to uh, answer that question. I'd say right now our, all, our, uh, all our work, it's a natural fit with SOI. It, it folds in very nicely with it uh, because we need that isolated substrate. Uh, I think as you look into the future of FinFET or, or double gates, uh, clearly can see this being applicable there. Uh, so new, new generations start to look a lot like uh, SOI in terms of where is, the, where is the substrate. And also, are there any fabs that are currently looking at doing ZRAM? Any fabs? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's multiple. Uh, uh, what, what time oh, frame? Oh, I see. Uh, with ZRAM, I, I probably can't answer that. I can say there's multiple fabs building uh, SOI, uh, you know, uh, SOI processing. 
Uh, but in terms of where the ZRAM technology is now, I might need to handle that uh, offline, and I'm probably not the right guy to answer that. Roger Doring, uh, Cal State East Bay. Um, you've only talked about this in terms of embedded. Are, are you foreseeing any kind of market for this for replacement for DRAM chips? Uh, <laughs> Oh, that's my dream, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've been working with DRAMs forever, so, you know, th to me that would be my dream. It's a natural fit with embedded just because, uh, you know, it's the low latency, uh, but, you know, uh, and I'm not very good at predicting the future, but, you know, I would love to see that happen, yeah. Uh, Don Draper from Rambus. So this is a, uh, a smaller cell than the one transistor embedded DRAM. But uh, how does it compare in refresh time? I'd say the refresh times are very comparable to what you would see with uh, embedded DRAM on a logic process, yes. Hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next speaker is a, uh, Akihito Takeo, who have got master degree in 1995 from Tohoku University in Japan. Then he joined Toshiba Corporation and engaged in the uh, computer simulation of the hard disk performance for the first three years at Toshiba R&D Center. Then he has been developing uh, perpendicular magnetic recording technology at Toshiba Ome Operation Center uh, for recent 10 years. He has also developed a future data recording technology in Center for Magnetic Recording Research in UC San Diego in year 2003 to 2004 as a visiting scholar. Now he is a group manager of the head media integration group of a hard disk drive development department of Toshiba and works for the new hard disk drive development. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, I'd like to talk about the ultra small hard disk drive for the mobile applications. Uh, this topic is uh, not exactly about uh, uh, hot chips, but uh, I think uh, this is uh, also about the uh, uh, storage device, uh, which is a candidate to the competitor with a flash memory. So I think uh, you have uh, had some interest about uh, this topic uh, as an engineer and also as an end user of the storage device. So this is today's outline. I'd like to discuss, uh, firstly, I'd like to talk about the uh, target consumer for the ultra small hard disk drive and the comparison with flash memories. And then uh, I'd like to explain about the mechanical future of the 0.85 inch hard disk drive. Uh, especially focus on the shock durability. And uh, secondly, I'd like to discuss about uh, uh, future prediction to keep the data capacity growth per year, uh, which will be possible to apply the new perpendicular recording systems. So this is a, a table about the today's hard disk drive typical capacity and the target market. And Typically, we have uh, four different uh, factors of the hard disk drive right now. Uh, 3.5 inch hard disk drive is focused on the uh, desktop PCs, servers, and the HDD video recorder, which has uh, become popular recently as a TiVo in the US and the DVD HDD recorder in Japan and Europe. And 2.5 inch drive is uh, used for the notebook PC, as you know, and also small size network server become popular, and car application is also one of the important devices for the hard disk drive. And 1.8 inch is uh, for the small mobile PCs and the MPC players like iPod, and the other portable video camera and players. And today's uh, main topic is about uh, 0.5 inch uh, smallest uh, factors hard disk drive which uh, data capacity is uh, 2 to 10 gigabyte right now, and these are focused on the for cell, uh, cell, phone, uh, cell phone and the MP3 players. 
So this is the comparison with uh, uh, compact uh, solid uh, silicon memories and the small sized hard disk drives uh, characteristics and specifications. The size of the 1.0 inch uh, hard disk drive, which is uh, popular as a micro drive produced by IBM and Hitachi, uh, is the same size as a compact flash. And recently, Toshiba produced a 0.85 inch hard disk drive, which is the smallest hard disk drive, and the size is uh, uh, the same as uh, SD card size, regular SD card size. But the thickness is a little bit larger, thicker than uh, flash card memories. So this is not for the uh, removable device. This is produced uh, only for the uh, non-removable device and the OEM uh, products. And uh, recently, actually, the shock durability is almost the same in the specification. And the temperature range is uh, almost the same as uh, flash memories. Only the difference is the uh, altitude margin. Uh, for the hard disk drive, we should uh, uh, keep guarantee about the head flying ability, uh, flying stability. So uh, it has uh, some limit about the altitude margin. So you should really care about if you want to use this kind of hard disk drive in the plane or the rocky mountain. So next, I'd like to discuss about the mechanical future of the 0.5 inch uh, hard disk drive. And let me ask you one question. How many people has uh, uh, experience about the trouble issues you are uh, hard disk drive broke down? <laughs> oh, less of, lots of. I have to apologize as a representative of the hard disk drive engineer. But the, uh, maybe you should know uh, the 25 percent, roughly estimated shown, the 25 percent of the such kind of hard drive energy uh, comes from the controller chips issues. <laughs> but uh, don't be serious. Uh, there is a not main cause for the uh, hard disk failure. Still, hard disk main failure is uh, mechanical issues, as about the uh, uh, spindle uh, motor, uh, unstable rotation, or uh, some uh, physical damage between head and media. So the sensitive part of the hard disk drive with external choke is like this. Uh, disk uh, we use a grass substrate disk for the small size drive. Uh, it's still winding and rolling uh, with the external shock. And heads, uh, head uh, was a suspect uh, with a suspension on the disk. And uh, during the rotation, this head part is a little bit uh, fly on the disk with a very small spacing, about 10 nanometer. So, but the once uh, external shock happened, the head suspension uh, lift off from the disc, and then hitting on the disc, says we have find the physical damage on the disc. So to avoid such kind of head disc physical interface uh, interaction, uh, so we uh, apply the lamp loading system in past five years. So uh, during the uh, idling time or uh, not uh, lighting reading time, head will be uh, escape on the lamp, which is uh, located on the outside of the magnetic disk. Then uh, head, uh, while head uh, stay in this position, even if we, we uh, HDD uh, applied uh, the external shock, it has uh, no physical damage between head and disk. But even if we apply the lamp loading system, it's, we still have a risk to uh, external shock physical damage with wide lighting and reading. But uh, especially focus on the small mobile size system like an MP3 player. Actually, data access frequency is quite few. So recently, uh, some of the mobile gadgets have a large buffer memories to temporarily store the HD data. Here's an example of the MP3 player. Uh, usually, uh, the data size for the one popular song is about uh, uh, four to six megabytes for the maybe three or ten, uh, five minutes song. And the play time is uh, about four to five minutes. But the buffer memory size is uh, much larger than uh, data size. So these mobile gadgets can store the, uh, more than three songs temporarily. 
Then uh, high disk drive data transfer rate is about uh, 12.5 megabytes per sec. For example, the, our 85-inch uh, hard disk drive. So the HDD data access time for the one data song is only about less than one sec. So during one song play out, the lead head has to be on disk for data reading only 0.3% time of the whole play out time. If you use an iPod or some other type of MP3 players, usually head is not on disk. Head is always stay in the lamp load, only uh, the short time, very short time to access the next song. So here is a, a, a 0.85 inch hard disk drive structure. Actually, the uh, structure is almost uh, same as uh, 2.5 inch or 1.85 inch uh, other factors uh, hard disk drive. Only the downscaling will be realized such kind of small uh, device. And the small uh, radius disk uh, easy to show the higher shock robustness because of its small rolling. And the small uh, suspension length also has an uh, advantage about the uh, shock durability. So the shorter head suspension and the small radius disc uh, uh, automatically achieves a better shock durability. This is a comparison the, about the shock durability specification between the different uh, disc size hard disk drives. So 0.85 inch drive, in the case of the 0.85 inch drive case, uh, it is about uh, uh, twice, uh, more than twice uh, shock durability between the no operating and the operating time. And the uh, operating frequency is in 0.85 inch is uh, much uh, less than the 2.5 inch. So considering the both operating and non-operating uh, shock durability, 0.85 inch drive has uh, more than three times uh, stable with, uh, compared with the 2.5 uh, hard disk drive. So this is a, a summary of the mechanical future of the uh, small size drive, uh, which has a compatible size with SD card memories and load and load system, uh, which will be reliable, uh, uh, realize uh, higher shock durability. Next, I'd like to uh, explain about the, how we can keep the data uh, capacity growth per year in the near future. So uh, before that, I'd like to explain what makes the uh, area density limit for the magnetic recording. Uh, actually, uh, scale sizing limit is a not serious issue because uh, if uh, semiconductor memory realizes 45 nanometer line process, we can easily uh, provide a similar size of the track width. And uh, magnetic bit size is much smaller than such kind of uh, process uh, limit, and because uh, we can realize uh, uh, bit size with uh, uh, magnetical uh, transition length limit. So the issue is a physical limit issue is a magnetic thermal fluctuation. Uh, the recorded, uh, supposed recorded uh, magnetization is the uh, upper side of the, this particle. It's uh, usually it's stable, and to fill up this magnetic direction to the opposite side, you need uh, uh, energy uh, more than uh, this uh, energy barrier. And this the energy barrier should be decided by the magnetic anisotropy coefficient and the volume of the particle. But uh, if summer energy, Boltzmann coefficient uh, times the temperature, is larger than this summer energy, uh, the, this magnetization couldn't keep the one state and easy to flip each other. So, uh, based on the previous many experiment limit, the ratio of this energy, KUV versus KT, should be larger than six to keep the magnetization amplitude more than 10 years. So this uh, uh, relationship will be decided the small, uh, small size of the magnetic particles. And uh, this is a typical image of the magnetic recording bit. It's including the many magnetic particles and grains. So uh, to keep the good SN, uh, signal to noise ratio. To get the larger data capacity, we need to be, uh, make it smaller. So we should uh, make it smaller the particle, uh, the volume of the particle size. But uh, if 
KV uh, versus KT becomes close to the 660 limit. Uh, this is a stable magnetization particle. But if we try to make it small volume with the same KU, it becomes unstable. And to keep the KUV energy uh, and constantly, we should uh, make the uh, higher KUV with a smaller volume. In this case, this is uh, still stable, but uh, uh, too much uh, higher uh, magnetic anisotropy will make it hard to derive the information with right head because of the limit of the right field ability. So to, uh, the right head ability will be, be define the limit of the KU then uh, we uh, have to, minimum volume uh, we should be limited by, to keep the, this relationship. Then, uh, this is a previous a typical recording style of the longitudinal, which is called the longitudinal recording system. Usually we use the remanence magnetization like this. In the plane, of, uh, the direction is uh, the same as the plane and direction of the disk then uh, the magnetic field will be generated between the gap, no, small gap of the, this magnetic yoke. So the many stray field is not stray on the disk. It's still keeping the gap. So uh, we can use only half of the uh, generation magnetic f uh, flux density in this case. And uh, also, uh, if the magnetic bit size becomes smaller, these magnetic uh, particles uh, become un unstable. So it is, has a limit to make a, a small uh, magnetic bit with longitudinal recording system to keep the thermal stability. Then now we provide a new uh, type of the recording strategy, which calls a perpendicular recording system. In this case, the concept is pretty simple. We just change the magnetic direction from the plane longitudinal side to the perpendicular side. In this case, the magnetic field generated between this head yoke and this uh, magnet, soft magnetic layer in, under the uh, disk. So the, uh, all of the magnetic generated field uh, goes on through the magnetic layer. Then we can use uh, two times larger magnetic field compared with uh, longitudinal recording system. And in this case, uh, the higher magnetic uh, data recording density become uh, each magnetic uh, remanence stays as more stable. And that, actually, this concept is uh, quite old, uh, which is proposed maybe uh, about uh, 30 years ago. And why we couldn't realize such kind of system before? It's because of the uh, medium magnetic property. Uh, previously, we found such kind of uh, low squareness uh, magnetic uh, properties, which is uh, x-axis shows a uh, applied magnetic field uh, image like a uh, rec uh, head recording field. And this is, uh, shows a uh, magnetic remanence. So if you apply the recording field in the positive side, magnetic remanence goes to like this. But if you stop to the magnetic, uh, applied magnetic field, the remanence still keep in this side. Then if you go to the apply the magnetic field on the negative side, the magnetization field is like this. But in previous case, if you stop to the magnetic field, uh, the remanence of the magnetization uh, already uh, become reduced at the zero po uh, field position. So it's not so summary stable. To get a summary stable um, perpendicular recording system, we need such kind of magnetic property. And then we realize this uh, kind of magnetic property with the cobalt, platinum, chrome oxide types materials. And uh, this is a recent uh, bit error rate performance uh, compared with the long chain recording and perpendicular recording. X axis shows a linear density, which is a megabit per inch. And uh, Y axis shows a bit error rate. Lower bit error rate is a more stable, uh, reliable data uh, readability. So uh, previous longitudinal recording couldn't achieve the 1.0 megabit per inch linear density. 
with a good beta error rate. But the recent perpendicular error rate is easy to achieve the higher uh, linear density compared with the long chain recording. And this is the next uh, second merit of the recent our perpendicular recording strategy. Uh, the recording density, error recording density will be decided by the uh, track density and the bit density. So if you can, uh, if we can, uh, we have to uh, increase the track density, we have to make one narrower head uh, with uh, some semiconductor process. So it has some limit. But uh, if we can uh, realize more higher linear density bit with the same error density, we can relax the track density. So this is the trend uh, between the linear de uh, bit density and the track uh, density. In the log previous long linear recording, it has some limit for the linear density. So recently, uh, this ratio towered to the more TPI track density side. But the perpendicular uh, recording realized it's more uh, BPI side, and which is also accelerates the uh, uh, data read write frequency because uh, on-track uh, on uh, data frequency is much faster than uh, lower BPI system. So this is uh, our recent uh, result about the uh, small size uh, drug, uh, hard disk drive specification, which is uh, used by the perpendicular recording system. Uh, right now, commercial products, we have a four gigabyte uh, 0.85 inch hard disk drive with longitudinal recording system. And in this sum, within this summer, we can produce uh, uh, eight gigabyte, which is uh, twice uh, larger than uh, previous commercial products hard disk drive by the perpendicular recording system. And we also have a pro prototype of the 10 gigabyte with this hard disk drive system. So in this case, uh, the linear density is much larger than previous uh, commercial products and we get uh, about a, a twice higher uh, density increment in this case. And this is a future prediction of the uh, hard disk drive area density trend. And past uh, several years, we can grow the area density about 100% per year. Actually, it's a crazy error. Uh, the, then we found uh, some kind of saturation trend like this and uh, we already found uh, some kind of the error density limit like around here with the previous longitudinal recording. But now we uh, realize the uh, next perpendicular recording system, which will be easy to keep the about 30 to 40% year error density growth, which is almost same as the Moore's law. And uh, it will be reach about uh, one terabyte per uh, square inch uh, error density recording. Uh, within five years, and which will be realized about uh, 60 to 80 gigabyte uh, data capacity with a 0.85 inch small size drive, and which will be uh, available to storage the high definition uh, video storage uh, as at today's morning session of the, with the video processors. So this is a today's summary. 0.85 inch hard disk drive was developed for the large data capacity storage device, which has a compatible size with the SD card memories. To utilize the ramp load system and temporary buffer memories, 0.85 inch shock durability is almost cleared about the 2000Z on the end user operating. And applying the perpendicular recording strategy, eight and 10 gigabyte prototype hard disk drive were realized. The technology will be keep area density growth over 30%, uh, 35% per year in coming five to 10 years. Thank you.